people think I'm damaged goods. I'm worried about losing my job. Will I ever get a transplant? I want to see my children graduate from college. How can I afford this? I don't want to be a burden. I'm afraid. I'm overwhelmed with information. Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever fall in love and get married. I just want to play with my friends. You're listening to Kidney Talk, streaming health, happiness, and hope to the renal community with your hosts, Lori Hartwell and Stephen First. Well, we're back, Stephen. Uh, Another week we, of Kidney Talk. Can we, you believe it? I I can believe it. I think we're just having a fabulous time doing this show, and we're going to be talking about preparing for a kidney transplant today. Right, and you know, but, but I want to tell you about the show because I've had people now come up to me and tell me how wonderful they love Kidney I Talk. I know. I've had a lot of great responses from people, and there's, it's so exciting to hear, you know. You know, at first the show was just a concept, and now it's a full production, and we're impacting people. We're talking about kidney transplants today, and I had a really interesting experience because I went to Las Vegas to last La- week. I was born in Las Vegas. Did you know that? I went to the hospital you I were know, born at. There's a big plaque in the lobby. Oh, yeah, right. It says Lori Hartwell <laughs> was born here. No, I interviewed two hospitals, and they were so different about, you know, the way they did their transplants and, and the everything. the process and everything. Absolutely. You know, and I chose the one that had the better water fountain. Oh, really? Well, the water fountain? What yeah, do you mean? because I like cold water. I don't like warm water. And so you're basing your whole transplant future on if the water's cold or hot? I figured I mean, if they can't get the water fountain right, how are they going to get a transplant <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? I guess that's a good point. Well, what were some of the other things you learned? The one that I chose was very, very encouraging. And the other one wasn't discouraging. It's just that they, they I, I felt like I was one of many, you know, waiting in line. Even though they had the same wait time, I just felt the other the hospital personal touch wasn't was there. so personal. And as a matter of fact, I said, you know, what's the best way to get back to the airport? Should I take a cab? And what side of the street should I catch the cab on and everything? And the transplant coordinator said, well, if you wait 15 minutes, I'll take you to the airport. Wow. Wow. They sold me right then and there. I know. I saved well, 15 bucks on the cab fare. <laughs> well, you know, we're going to be talking about preparing for a kidney transplant. And we have a very good friend of mine, uh, an amazing woman. Um, you have she, good friends? I do have a few friends. Oh. I know that's hard to believe. Oh, okay. But, yes, uh, we're going to be talking to Jackie Harris. Who's Wait, Jackie? Jackie Harris? Jackie Harris. I love Jackie (laughs) Harris. I love her. I know. Isn't she terrific? Jackie Harris is a certified clinical transplant coordinator. Um, You know, she's an executive healthcare specialist and has been with Estellas Pharma for the past six years. Estellas Pharma? Estellas Pharma. Yes, they make transplant medication. Oh, but why don't you just say pharmaceutical? Because it's written pharma. Uh huh. And script. you just read everything that says pharma. Okay, so we can call her Jackie Hare if it's short on the script, right? Exactly. We don't have to, we don't have to say typo, Harris. If there's a typo, you're just going to read it. I'm just going to read it. And she's also a board member for the Renal Support Network. So oh, I I've... love the Renal Support Network. <laughs> It's my favorite network, other than NBC, ABC, and CBS, and sometimes Fox. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) She's speechless again. Okay. Anyways, um, we'll be back with Jackie. (laughs) Jackie Har. We'll be right back with Jackie Har. My name is Jenny Huey. There is a critical shortage of organs. 91,000 people are waiting for a transplant. I am one of those people waiting for a kidney like many of you listening. I wait for my transplant coordinator to call me with the good news, that they have a kidney for me. Other young women my age are waiting for that special someone who they met online at that dating website, Match.com, to call. And I'm waiting for the right cross match. It is important that we all inform our friends, family, and co-workers about the importance of becoming a donor and to make sure they sign a donor card. Also, they need to discuss this very important decision with their family. We all need to bring awareness to the public about the importance of giving the gift of life so I can continue on with my life, dialysis-free, and have guys waiting patiently by the phone for me. 
Well, welcome, Jackie, to our show. Hi, Lori and Stephen. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, well, we're thrilled to have you. Before we start, do you have a good water fountain at your hospital? Yes, we do. Okay. I'm sold. <laughs> I'm sold. <laughs> That's the new criteria okay. for transplantation. I wonder if they'll put that in the uh, the surveys that they do at the transplant centers. What's the water fountain like? Yeah, what's fountain. the the, the one-year survival rate and what's your water fountain like? <laughs> Is there a particular temperature that you prefer? I do like it really cold. Yeah, don't you hate it when you're at these really multi-billion dollar high-rises and you go to the water fountain and a little Luke trickle warm. comes out yeah, and it's Luke warm. Warm trickle, yeah. Oh, it's oh, horrible. Or, or the other alternative is you push the button and the water just squirts you up the nose. <laughs> that I, mean, I actually uh, like. That, <laughs> that I actually like. It's, yeah. it's kind of a rush to me. <laughs> well, anyways, we're going to be talking about preparing for a kidney transplant. And you've had all this experience for so many years. You know, How do you know if you're a candidate for a kidney transplant? I mean, that's really one of the things I think a lot of people who are listening to this show may may be thinking right it's, it's true because you know you know I've asked you know people on dialysis I said are you on the waiting list they go no I, I really don't think I could be on the waiting list or you know I think I'm too old you know so wh- how do you actually get on the right waiting there's list? a lot of self-determining by folks out there and you need to stop that um, first you have to want a transplant not your family not your friends not right. somebody around you you have to want it and all of the centers around here pretty much nationwide you can self-refer or your nephrologist can refer you for you to right. get you started into the ballpark. To a transplant center, to actually to a, a transplant, transplant nephrologist. Center. Right. So your nephrologist in the community would refer you in. Okay. Absolutely. So it wouldn't be good like if your massage therapist recommended you Probably for a transplant. Probably not so good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, no, so I mean, it might, you know, Laura, that's you're going to have to cut that out then. <laughs> <laughs> and Noted. also, <laughs> patients need to know that Title 22 entitles them to a transplant evaluation. Title 22. No, Title 22. We, and that's that? something that covers all renal patients, and it guarantees you the right as a U.S. citizen mm-hmm. to have a transplant evaluation. Some physicians are not transplant friendly. Some, because of the volume of their business, they've got a lot of dialysis patients, don't have a lot of time for transplant, so they don't make it a high priority. So some patients can be really motivated, and their community nephrologist might say, gosh, you know, I don't know, and kind of hem-haw around about it, but they can actually self-refer themselves to a program. I see. You know, some you know, physicians just aren't friendly to begin with. Well, that's a whole nother show. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But I'm a huge patient advocate, so the more that you can do for yourself um, and be really motivated, the better overall. So basically, um, how I understand it is is that a transplant nephrologist or a transplant center has to tell you that you're not a candidate, not your own physician. Right. And that's and really some, some what's physicians important. like to do that. And granted, there are some train wreck patients out there, and you may be one right. of those. But let the transplant team be the ones right. to make that decision. Right. Yes. So they will tell you if you you cannot get a transplant. Absolutely. Right. The center. Absolutely. The center itself. And you know, so then once you go through it, then you go through the process, and then the transplant center just says, "Okay, you're a candidate." Then right. you go on the list. And it is a huge process. Steve and it sounds like you had great time in, in Las Vegas. Yeah, I went to two <laughs> hospitals and spent hours and hours and hours, and only because... Following the yellow brick road from appointment to appointment. Right, and exactly. Test and, to test. and just, you know, I just, you know, it, it is a long process, and this is the third time I've done it, because, yes. you know, I'm, I'm registered at three so different places. So you're looking places. at multi-listing, and right. that's something we'll get to a little bit later in the yes. show as well. Right. Yes. It's a very exhaustive process, and for patients who are tired, maybe a little anemic, um, most of the centers try to make it very user-friendly and sometimes bring the people to you as you stay in one location. Others, you've got a whole schedule, um, like an agenda letter, that you follow from point A to point B, B to C, from appointment to appointment. There are so many team members that you need to see and a lot of lab work that needs done. Right. Because I know, I mean, they draw tubes and tubes of blood from you. Twelve and tubes of 12 blood tubes. total. Oh, my goodness. But what was amazing, you know, the difference between the two hospitals I went to, one was like that. The other one wasn't like that. But, like, one hospital I saw a dietitian, a mm-hmm. social worker, a financial counselor, and then maybe for 10 minutes the surgeon. Mm-hmm. But I... You know, I never got any tests done. The other hospital I went to, I saw the nephrologist. I saw the I saw the surgeon that who would actually do the operation. I then I I got an echocardiogram mm-hmm. and I got a kidney uh, uh, what, they ultrasound. The ultrasound, you know, yes. and I had blood drawn and and it was a totally different experience. Now they may have shared the information. 
since they're both in that same city. And you'll find that also if you're multi-listing, you'll have one really comprehensive exam done at one center. Mm -hmm. And then if you're looking at other ones, people want to kind of eyeball you. Um, some right. do a more intensive exam, but mm -hmm. they take that basic package of a workup, as mm -hmm. it's called, and they will share that. Right. So it saves you time. Yeah, I think energy, I would have to request one finance. hospital to get the records from the other hospital right. because they're not. In but it saves you having multiple oh, of the yeah. same tests and blood drawn. Oh, absolutely. You know, kind absolutely. of unnecessarily. And one of the things I always hate is all the tests I had to take. But you know, it's so necessary. I know because they need to really evaluate you. Right. And can you mention some of the tests that are just and common? That's actually a, a great point because we had community nephrologists, especially, that would call and say, "Okay, I got your checklist. These four thousand items." that need done, do you really need those or is, it just, is this just a rote exercise? <laughs> and they are very necessary, especially cardiovascular tests, EKGs, treadmills, colonoscopies, things like that um, are really well needed and especially as patients um, age to have that baseline pre-transplant. Because once you're transplanted, put on immunosuppressants, your cardiovasculature takes a hit Mm -hmm. So you want to be as healthy as you can going into it. And it is a lot of steps, and it's a lot of tests that right. seem kind of fluff on the surface. Right. Why am I doing really, this again? Exactly. And when you've got doctors even thinking, gosh, you know, do they really need that? And not really knowing the extent of why those tests are needed. We had one case in point where a gentleman who was in his mid-60s, fairly well-known in the L.A. area, went through his transplant evaluation gleaming six months after his transplant died, turned out he had a colon cancer that was undetected. And they okay. had done some tests, but not... The full test. Not as full as they probably should have in retrospect. That's my because least favorite test, too. So, yeah, it's not one that people line up for. Right. No. I know. Not, no. It's a real pain in the... But anyways. It's actually hard. Um, <laughs> now, they passed out Krispy Kremes or something, you yes. know, as an incentive. It's great for diabetics. <laughs> Perfect. No, Perfect. No, no, but, you know, no. but, you know, some of the tests are fluff, too. You, you know what test I hated? I I also hated the origami test, the one where they make you... But were you able to do it? That's no, a, it was that's fluff. A it was pure, I don't know See, what, what that has to do. The reason you do the origami test is so you can navigate the healthcare um, system uh, and the insurance, uh, the insurance and system. Yes. And that's if you can follow directions. If you can't follow directions, then... It's true. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so you get listed, you go through the process, and then one of the things I know is that you want to know where you're at. So uh, I know one of the questions I get is, do you call the transplant coordinator and say, where am I on the list? Did you get a lot of these calls oh, as a transplant the coordinator? Infamous, where am I on the well, wait, list? Well, where are you a transplant coordinator? Where, where? I was at Cedars for about eight years. Oh, you're at Cedars. And then UCLA for about a year, and then I jumped ship to pharmaceuticals. And now I'm able to do their transplant education. Oh, I um, see. And a lot in the community as well as the transplant center. Because so it was in, a nice in, transition. In regards to Lori's question, I I got to tell you, uh, the difference between talking to a smaller region, I can get the transplant coordinator to take me to the airport. Right. But you call UCLA, I and I don't know what it's like. Happen here in right. town. Uh, it's Cedar Sinai. <laughs> I, I haven't been to Cedars. You may, but, if you wait till the end of the shift, possibly after they've done a couple calls and they're headed home about seven thirty at night. But I can't night. even get my transplant coordinator on the phone at UCLA. It's really difficult. I'll call difficult. her, and I'll be lucky if she calls me back in ten days, and then I've forgotten the question. Yes. You know? right. Sorry to hear that, and it really taints. And people think, "Gosh, I'm being neglected." A lot of it is patient load okay. at Cedars, where they did. We were doing about sixty-five transplants a year, and there were. 200 patients on the waiting list as opposed to the thousands at UCLA, and they were doing about 300. So, for instance, when I was at Cedars, to do 65 transplants a year, it's pretty low volume. You get right. to know everybody. I pretty much knew the waiting list off the top of my head. Right, you almost, knew the people individually. Almost to the of. anal retentive point of remembering phone numbers, who their doctors were, things like that. It, it gets a little twisted. But still, even at 65 but a year, that, as opposed to the, the hospital hundred, I went to. UCLA, when I was there, like I said, it was just there about a year, and I had 400 patients. I was a pre-transplant coordinator. 400 patients, patients is a lot. Right. And you're making sure they're all up to date and keeping track of everyone and if they've been re-hospitalized while they're on the waiting list and gathering data. And you're still evaluating new patients and their donors, getting everything compiled. Well, it's I'm a tired. large volume. <laughs> well. And like I was saying, you know, 65 a year seems a lot. You know, or not a lot, as opposed that, to UCLA. Right. But I went to, like I said, this hospital in Vegas, and they do thirty a year. 
Right. And the, and the that's orient- the difference, the smaller much group. different right. atmosphere. And the orientation, I was one of probably 100 patients in the mm-hmm. massive orientation at UCLA one day. Mm-hmm. And I was in one, the auditorium. In the auditorium. <laughs> and this hospital up in Las Vegas, I was one of three patients right. in right. the orientation. And it makes a huge difference. You're not a number. Not that it's bad. Right. They have great outcomes at yes. the larger centers. but I was transplanted at UCLA, and I'll be celebrating my... 17th year anniversary next year. Congratulations. I know. So it's a... But it is a totally different feel. And for patients, especially if they're from rural areas, not so much big city, it makes them feel a lot more at home and feel like their needs are being taken care of in a smaller environment. Well, when we come back, we're going to find out what's the best way to communicate with your transplant coordinator. You know, some people would use sign language. (laughs) You know, some people would use hieroglyphics. Exactly. But there is a better way to communicate with your transplant coordinator, and we're going to find out when we come right back. about your high school years, one of the strongest memories people have is their prom. It's their one night to shine, one night to dance the night away, one night to ride in a stretch limo, one night to feel like a star. This January 14th, the Renal Support Network will hold its eighth annual premiere event, the Renal Teen Prom. This is the chance for teens to stop thinking about the needle sticks, the PD exchanges, and the constant meds they have to take. For one night, they celebrate their life with hundreds of other teen kidney patients, and the only prescription is, have the time of your life. So this January 14th, join us on the campus of prestigious Notre Dame High School in Sherman Oaks, California. The prom features live entertainment, a renal-friendly dinner, dancing, limo rides, glamour photos, and Hollywood celebrities. And get this, it's absolutely free. To receive an invitation or make a donation to an Evening Among the Stars renal teen prom, Visit rsnhope.org or call 818-543-0896. That's 818-543-0896. You've got the power to brighten someone's life. This is your chance to shine like the stars. Hi, folks. Crazy Kenny Kid here to tell you about the incredible specials we're having. We are definitely wheeling and dealing this weekend. If I can't put you in a proper axis, a lifeline like me and the missus like to call them, and I'll stand on my head and eat a low-sodium bug. First, we have a Crazy Kenny Kid special on hemodialysis access with several different models. We have catheters great for the beginners or in any emergency, but you'll soon want to move up to a more sporty model. Next, we have the AV graft, a good utility access, but believe me, sweet folks, I have saved the best for last, the fistula. This is the access that everyone is talking about. You'll get great mileage and years of use with this baby. What's that you say? Hemo just doesn't fit the lifestyle you prefer, PD? Well, feast your eyes on this baby. Oh, I forgot this is radio. You'll just have to trust me on this one, folks. This is the PD catheter model. Beautiful, efficient, and easily hidden from view. So take your pick. We're dealing all week. We'll really have to move these babies. Keep your access clean and free of infection. A daily check for signs of redness and warmth could indicate infection. Check with your health care team for tips on how to keep your dialysis access clean and safe for use. And remember, if I can't put you in one of these lifelines, I'll stand on my head and eat a low-sodium bug. So what are some ways to communicate with a transplant coordinator? You've heard of a telephone? (laughs) Yeah, but you really right. have to can't get her on the phone, though, like UCLA. <laughs> right. Um, you need to keep calling. Not to be kind of the, the stick in the side. Or the squeaky wheel. Or the will. Squeak, but the squeaky wheel gets the, the attention. Kidney. Oil. Gets the kidney. Exactly. Um, you really want to touch base right. live. If it's nothing else but leaving a message, leaving right. to keep communication. Um Review the contact list. Get that person live. You know, give her, even if you have to leave a message, call me on my cell phone between 
this time and this right. time. She may be able to call you, you know, if she's in between clinic patients or if she gets back to the office after clinic. That's a huge chunk of it because they're so tied up either during pre-clinic, post-clinic. It's not that they're ignoring you. They get back to the office and then they pick up those three messages that you've left in the last 15 minutes saying, I called you twice already. Call me back. And you <laughs> can't say. You can't say. And you know what? Either return my call or I'm going to take my business or I'm elsewhere. Or take my business elsewhere. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. What right. about email? Do you know of any transplant coordinators or, or do you know? You do get bombarded, though. If they had 400 right. people emailing them, they would never get through and their email so box. And there's so much else that's emailed as well. You don't want to get lost in, in the shuffle. And I really prefer in this day and age of instant messages and texting and, and emailing, you really want live contact, especially with transplant, because you want to be able to touch base and update. If you've changed dialysis schedule, if you've changed from Monday, Wednesday, Friday to Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, that's a huge consideration. Right. If they're working on a transplant at two in the morning and they think you're on a certain schedule and you've been dialyzed that day when in fact you haven't. Now, does the patient that communicate it, it that alters. or does the clinic communicate that? The patient really needs to do that. Everybody thinks, and I can't do the arms pointing each way, I'm on the radio here, but everybody thinks the other person is taking care of it. The nephrologist thinks the patient's taking care of it. The dialysis center thinks the doctor's taking care of it. And it turns into a catch-22 where the coordinators really don't get the information. They don't have ESP, despite what people right. think. <laughs> it might be just a good idea to just give an update and even fax it to them and say, look, this Absolutely. is the schedule. Get their fax number. And update and addresses. If you've had insurance changes, phone numbers, right. cell phone numbers, if yeah, you carry a really pager, important. check right. your batteries, We actually like had a call from um, a dialysis clinic that knew that a patient worked with us because her number changed Mm -hmm. and they contacted us to see if we had more current information on her right and we actually did. Right. Um, and you ran into and that a lot. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Trying to find this patient. The patient did get the transplant and everything worked out. We so sent was... sheriffs to people's houses in the middle of the night only to find out that somebody new lives there. Oh, <laughs> wow. Because all of the numbers were changed, but we did have an address, so we figured we'd try that and to well, know of it. The ranger station connected um, UCLA Transplant Center through to... I was camping when I yes. got called. I had so, one of but those I... at Cedars. We found them camping this, up in Arroyo. But I actually left a message where I was. Bingo. So that's how they found me. And Boy, can you otherwise... imagine? You send the sheriff to somebody's house to alert them they have a kidney. They die. Then you have an extra kidney to transplant. <laughs> That's sick. That is death. really sick. Listen, can somebody actually <laughs> call and see? I'm sorry about that. I just it's my way of thinking. Hey, there's an extra kidney. Maybe I can get or in on the action. Or you panic mode because they've got a meth lab that's in their garage and yeah. they think they're busted. It's a whole nother show. Now, can you actually call your transplant coordinator and say, "Where am I on the list?" Like a restaurant reservation? You or something? can, but when you say, "Where am I on the list?" If they had a nickel for every time they heard that, they could retire young. Then with kidney, there's no way to know where right. you are on the list. Yeah, because you, they don't know when the you kidney's going to come in. Exactly. Yeah. It's based on when you were placed on the list and your blood type. So it's time and blood type. So let's say, Lori, you have three offers this week. You might come up number nine for the first offer, number 19 for the second offer, and number four for the third offer, based on how well you match right. that particular donor. But when you're getting close to the top. As you're getting closer well, and the more time that you put in, right. so you don't leave you your do cell phone behind or something up. like that. Right. And I'll tell you, even being number 19, right. you mm-hmm. could end up getting the transplant because the people ahead of you either have moved. Right. Something has happened that they've become inactive and they just haven't been inactivated on the list. Or they're sick. Um, or they're sick. Peritonitis, huge issue. Patients that are on dialysis, key point, keep healthy, keep on top Boy. of issues, especially when you're on the transplant list, <laughs> because they'll they'll skip right over you with an active case of peritonitis. Even if you have a cold. Absolutely. If you have a cold, they won't transplant you. So, right. so wash those my hands. patient number 19. <laughs> what if you have a bunion? It. Sorry, there's silence <laughs> again. Question. Sorry, silence uh, again. Have you ever been asked that question in your um, I don't think so, Stephen. That's years? a first. It's a first if uh, you have a bunion. Okay, now I've Origami been... Origami uh, and bunions. Okay, right. note to self. <laughs> I've been hearing all the all the risk factors of transplants because people think a transplant is their answer to everything. So th- I know there are some risk factors. Can you share with us some of those? There are. And first and foremost, to remember that, treat, that transplant is a treatment option. Right. It's not It's a cure. not the holy grail. It's not a cure all. And that's another thing people keep saying, oh, I just can't wait till I get my transplant. It's all taken care of. Once I get that transplant, I have reached the pinnacle. Um, and it's just not so. There are bumps along the road, Lori, as you can attest, right. and many I've patients. I've had three transplants. My first two didn't work. Um, they were tough. Right. But a third one's been, you know, over well, seven, thing, 16 years. Uh, one of the precautions, uh, you know, I just learned, because I thought I, I, you know, doing this show and everything, I thought, wow, I, I know all there is to know now, you know, in the last six months, I've learned <laughs> so it all. you're an expert now. Yeah. 
Yeah. Ooh. But the one thing I didn't know is that you're, when you have the transplant, you you must wear sunscreen right. all the time. Absolutely. And that you're also 10% more susceptible to lymphoma, lymphoma cancer. Yes. And one of the beauties of transplant now, as opposed to even 10 years ago, with all of the newer drugs that mm-hmm. are out and the regimens that they can put patients on, they can so custom tailor for each individual person. It's not a cookie cutter, like you like come in cocktail. and here's what you get. <laughs> A set cocktail. cocktail. They formulize it for you based on female versus male, age, because the lymphoma risk is the elderly patients, um, higher immunosuppression that's used, which kidney patients don't fall into, like the lungs and hearts are really immunocompromised. Um, Kidney patients a little bit less so. But still you're looking at that cumulative effect. What's your family history? Mm -hmm. Are you Hispanic? rates of diabetes, things like that, recurrent disease. Right. And that's something when you go in for your transplant evaluation, ask your doctor, here's you know, what's, what my underlying disease is. What's my chance of it recurring with a transplant? You take all these Im- immunosuppressant drugs, which are wonderful, and you know because they help you keep the kidney, but they also suppress your immune system, right. which has other impact um, with your body. And I know uh, one of the things I'm grateful for is that you don't have to take as many steroids, and some people right. aren't taking any nowadays, and that's a whole other subject. I know, that's the other but thing. that's very exciting. Steroid free. There's a big push for steroid withdrawal and steroid free. And that's exciting as a person who lives with a you know a kidney transplant because when I had my first transplant, they gave you so many steroids that Were you like I a balloon? don't know. It was I was like a balloon, and she I looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know, and I would eat anything. I, I you know I never even fathomed eat, liking liver, and I would have eaten it. I was 13 years old, and I didn't care. I would have eaten a shoe. <laughs> they and were slapping I, stuff out of her hands. <laughs> they were slapping. They said, "Lori, please stop eating." <laughs> and it was such a miserable feeling because I never was. You know, I was always hungry, right. and that was such a you know that transplant didn't work. Is that caused work. by the steroids? Um, at that in the, those days, yes, it was. It was a massive amounts of steroids. So, right. um, not as opposed to and today, the they're more metal. Feeling. Yeah, the joke was you'd put you know a cleaning rag on each hand and each foot and let somebody loose in the house and they just clean right. the entire house. Oh, it, it, makes you it makes you very it hyper. Makes you very and moody. I mean, and moody. moody. You're like Ooh. a walking Hallmark card. Yes, you're oh like happy gosh. one day and crying. And I actually wrote about this in my book, Chronically Happy, like the mood swings that I had in the beginning until I became adjusted with it. And I don't have any mood swings now, as you're very aware of. So, um, so I'm that's totally normal. Um, she just bit my head <laughs> off last week. And that's something, even with the lower doses, you still see, and the whole psychosocial right. aspect comes into play with spouses and relationships yeah. and just the roller coaster ride of transplant. Coaster. And that's where your social worker during the eval really, really comes in handy for getting all those cards but out you on know the what? table. I'm finding that social workers in the kidney community are more like secretaries, like uh, if you need to travel, if you need some forms filled out. I really haven't seen. Seen them in oh, the you haven't seen the good period. ones then. What? Yeah. You haven't seen the good ones yet then. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. It's it's um. There's You're so deficient. much. You're deficient. Your social worker deficient. Is deficient. <laughs> I hope she's not listening. To this. No, they are great. They're very good resources as far as what's available in the community. What's available, you know. Finding out. Well, finding that's out all things. the bad stuff. But they're yeah. also huge advocates for mental well-being. Right. Well, we've we've gone over all the cons of the kidney transplant and everything. Tell us the positive things about the kidney transplant. Positive is quality of life. You've got your life back. Even with the bumps in the road. Right. You've got a healthier body, um, a healthier outlook on life, better life ex- expectancy. Right. And the, the, the transplant run. works, yes. Right. And making sure, again, that that your medications are adjusted where they need to be because cardiovascular, as I mentioned previously, is huge. And actually, actually post-transplant, the highest risk or the highest um, mortality is because of cardiovascular, not your underlying renal disease. Right. So for patients on dialysis... I mean, that's what people don't realize. They die of cardiovascular disease um, with kidney disease. It's not because their uh, kidneys aren't working or they don't have any. It's because of the cardiovascular complications. Right. So taking no. the drugs that minimize those and prolonging life. 
Well, the best thing I know about a transplant is that I didn't have to do dialysis anymore. There you go. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> that was one of the big perks. And, and that, that I could eat what problem. I wanted to. You know, I could eat and drink what I wanted to, you know. That would you be try my to biggest be, thing is the, be, is the fluid uh, restriction. I hate that. Right. Fluid and dietary restrictions right. that are lifted. You can you know, have pasta in a avocados, sauce again. And avocados. Lo- avocados yeah. and all those things that you were, you know, forbidden from having on dialysis. Right. You now have again. That's it. And, you know, and then the, the, the con is, is that, you know, three years after your transplant, you, you know, you don't have the Medicare um, coverage in for your immunosuppressant drugs, which we'll have on a different topic right. and a talk about the whole other story. But most people, I so hope, forth. will have secondary insurance and stuff yes, to help they, pay for that. And there's right. a lot of national initiatives that are trying to look at I mean, that, that sounds, because it is I mean, issue. I know that's another show, but that, that is so ridiculous because would they rather you go back on dialysis and have them pay 100%? Now, what precautions do we need to take, you know, so we don't miss the potential transplant? Just making sure that you're up to date. Like I mentioned earlier, making sure that your coordinator has all your information. If you're traveling, where you'll be, contact numbers. And do you know most patients on the list to have a cell phone? And I know they have some programs where they're giving cell phones if you don't have one. They used to give away beepers. Yes. But but they they don't do that anymore. They don't do that anymore. Because of cell phones. Right. The cell phones have replaced that. And make sure they're charged. That's a good point. Make sure they're charged. I don't know how many times, you know, patients would go out without them being charged. Um, My luck, I'll be watching a movie and, and, and turn it off during the two-hour movie and I'll get the call. That's my law. Absolutely. Murphy's Law. Or if you've got some big trip plan, or your nephrologist has a big trip plan. What should you bring to the hospital once you get called for a transplant? I mean, what could people do to prepare in advance to have a few things in order? First and foremost, have your insurance cards ready because they greet you by name and what's your insurance (laughs) when you get to the hospital. A map if you're coming from outside of the immediate area. If you don't know the streets where you're you're coming from, um, have a map ready. Obvious robe, pajamas, things like that. Don't bring your Victoria's Secret um, because you'll Victoria's you'll have Secret incisions. Victoria's Secret what? Don't bring teddy. your Victoria's Teddy. Your teddy. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Lori, yeah. Don't, I actually think it would probably work because don't you know, bring they... your Teddy, Lori, and don't bring your <laughs> don't bring your thongs. <laughs> We laugh, but it's happened. Really? Yes. Oh, really? Well, you want to look good when you're kid. You want to look good when you're recouping. Believe me, I don't look good in thongs. <laughs> We've heard. <laughs> But you're, you're recouping, and you've got an incision that's draining, and you might have a drain inserted. It, I left the hospital gown on the whole entire not, time. I, you you know what? I always bring the nightgown or whatever. And, you know, at this point, after you get out of surgery or whatever, you're, you know, you're laying in a hospital gown. It's just more practical right. for me anyways. And I it's gave such a up quick the, stay. I gave up the trying to look good. <laughs> and, trying to look um, hot. <laughs> You know, you know, when you're a little younger and you have some cute transplant doctors around, you try. Oh, she's still but, going on about her doctor. This, we hear Dr. this every DeFlo. show. Doctor he was my transplant. Um, the you know, when I had my transplant, he was the nephrologist. Doctor there. DeFlo. Oh yes, and he, you know, he's he's famous on the show. Yes, but. Um, Unfortunately, I came from the mountains because I was camping to the transplant, so I didn't have a chance to go shopping before my transplant, and I didn't have this list on how to prepare. So I didn't look all that great so when I got my would transplant. Not have looked good with the hiking boots. That's a exactly. fashion no-no. So do you bring snacks and everything in case you get hungry, or what? You really shouldn't. Oh. Once they tell you to head to the hospital, nothing to eat or drink. No right. diverting to Seven Eleven to grab the big gulp and you know yeah. something One for a One last fluid yeah. intake before yeah. it's Don't over. Eat right. All that because kind of stuff. You might go to surgery. It's such a quick timing, and you're traveling while they're doing the final test on the kidney. You don't want to get there and have to have it delayed. It adds more time to the kidney sitting. You right. want it put in, you know, the quicker the better. Yeah, yeah. And that's where dialysis schedules are handy so that they know you've already been dialysis, you know, dialyzed. <laughs> you said the kidney sitting. I picture this kidney like in a little director's it's in a chair. Little box. It's in a little, isn't it a little ice chest? <laughs> it is in a little chest. It's packed in a chest inside a box that's marked with, you know, hazardous, you know, oh, materials, etc. Which is so great on an elevator as an aside. When you have that box and a few people around and you jiggle it just a little bit, just, you know. You jiggle the kidney? You jiggle the kidney. No, the box just a little so oh, people think it's alive. Can you imagine? I think of this, you know, <laughs> think of, think of this like nightmare. <laughs> they mix up the coolers and they go to put the kidney in and you got a six-pack of Coca-Cola. 
it could be a problem. Oh my god! You know, unless you really like Coke. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then it's good as a six pack and not a whole. You know, just not one can. Well, we've learned a lot today. <laughs> I know we have. Um, anything else that you think people who are preparing well, for a kidney oh, transplant should know? To have a telephone tree. That's the other thing. Oh, you can what? Especially a telephone tree, and this isn't a tree, Stephen. Like you know, what is a, a pine tree. tree? It's a telephone That's tree. where you have one main contact person. And if you've got a small family, it's not as of a, a big concern as larger families. And usually with transplant, the yeah, so what if you're like comes. the Osmonds? Right. right. And they all call the, the hospital. And they all call the hospital. And they all call the floor or the ICU or the transplant coordinator and talk about bombarded. So if you designate one person as your telephone tree, all that information goes to that person and they, they then disseminate it to the rest of your family and friends so that the patient can recoup and not having to recount right. the story, you know, press one to hear about how I'm doing today and press two to hear about how my kidney's doing. And right. It, it does it get a little really repetitive after a while. It helps and cuts down on the repetitiveness. It's the first time I've ever heard of telephone training. So do you know who's going to be the head of your tree? Who's the head of my tree? <laughs> yes. My dog? <laughs> I think it might be Lorraine. Uh. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> and other um, arrangements to make ahead of time. Child care, newspaper and mail delivery. Nothing screams break in here yeah, more you know than I, things laying around your lawn. You, know, right. you want your mail and well, paper taken like care of. that's when you travel, too, the same Absolutely. Yeah. You know, lawn care, pool care, things like All that. You know what my wife does, which is great? When we go away on a vacation, she turns on a radio and a television so there's sound coming right. in, the, in the house. To go along with the timed lights on the right. timer. Right, yes. Exactly. Absolutely. But uh, we, the only thing with our time lights, it's a clap on, and there's nobody there to clap. So it's very difficult. You need difficult. music, Macarena oh, or something oh, going perfect. to exactly. <laughs> so you, you have a solution to every problem I, I have. Well, that is a transplant I was a coordinator. coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to receive information and materials regarding transplantation, join the Transplant Experience Program by calling 1-877-482-7627. When you enroll, you'll receive a free transplant information kit, including including a resource journal and your own copy of this video, Sharing the Experience. The Transplant Experience Program provides information, tools, resources, and inspiration to patients at every stage of the transplant process, all free of charge. Call 877-482-7627 today and join Transplant Experience, sponsored by Estellas. Well, that was really informative, don't very, you think? Very informative. And you know what? I didn't realize, um, I read the other day that, what, what is there, like 92,000 people yes, on a... Yes, in the a, United States waiting for a kidney. Waiting for a kidney. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's not kidney. It's actually all organs. Um, oh, right. That's right. It yeah, was all 67, organs, but 67,000 was kidney. Yes, and then about 2,400 are waiting for a kidney pancreas, which is really exciting. I, um, You know, kidney pancreas that they can actually cure diabetes now with a, or cure it, or treat it, I should say. It's not well, cure. Well, no, actually, actually, it is a cure because I know a guy who got a kidney uh, pancreas transplant and he's no longer a diabetic. Right. But it's kind of the same thing as a kidney transplant. It's the kidney pancreas is just treating the kidney disease like the diabetes. So if the pancreas fails, they, they become a diabetic again. So I think it's actually a treatment, not a cure. Oh, okay. A transplant's a treatment. It's not a cure. I'm right. actually certain about that. Right. So... I'm trying to. But I'm trying to impress you with my knowledge. You are, aren't you? you know aren't you like you, amazed? I I am amazed every time I see you. <laughs> I'm also amazed that you said that you ate liver. I did um, when I was 13 years old, and after the transplant failed, I never ate it again. <laughs> Um, it's a I, I, I really it's, you hated know, it's it. It's such I a mean, horrible My mother food. loves it. My mother oh, loves it. Oh, my gosh. But when I, I was just growing up, we not, had chopped uh, liver, but you, you kind of mush it up with a lot of eggs and uh, onions and everything. I, just, it just I can't even eat that now. No, I'm just not a big fan of it. But um, as I said, you know, people listening out there, you know, transplantation has really come a long way. Um, I have seen it. Um, I have lived it and the advancements in it. And uh, my first transplant, I tell you, I'll never forget that feeling of just being so hungry, but I was on massive doses of steroids. And uh, today, they don't use that protocol, um, thankfully, to all the new drugs that are available to help treat rejection. So that's very and, exciting. And, and what was your food of choice? I mean, anything. Back then. Really? Anything. I'm you didn't serious. crave it? It anything. wasn't like you're pregnant it or something. Didn't you craved care. something? It was just that it was just this. I don't know if you have never 
not eaten for a couple of days. Have you ever not eaten you know for what? a couple not of days? You know what? Not in my life. <laughs> okay. Can't <laughs> you, you said tell? it, not me. Um, but uh, it, it's this hunger that you can I've never experienced it since that time, but it was this hunger where you were just, you couldn't even concentrate on watching TV or anything else. There was just this, this appetite. appetite. You, you and, can get it out, right? Um, yes. I mean, I'm starting to, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. <laughs> and well, so, we better you stop know, talking about this I then. know. And then I was going through rejection, so they were really pushing a lot of meds on me. Rejection so, from the kidney, though. Yeah, it wasn't. People it, weren't rejecting yeah, you, though. No, no. I, but I was probably being rejected at dinner because I ate all everybody else's well, food. Well, people were just afraid so, to put their um, arms and <laughs> hands close to your mouth. It was just the worst feeling. Well, I'm glad so. it's it's calmed down now. I know. I, I've been to lunch with you, and you eat like a lady. I behave myself. You do. Thank you. you eat like a lady. You share the hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> And, uh, you know, everything's cool now with you. (laughs) We can control our own destiny. We can take charge of our health and ask questions about our medical options. We can form partnerships with our health care team. We can take steps towards self-improvement. We can be sensitive to the impact of our disease on our family. We can sing, dance, laugh, and enjoy our lives. We can appreciate today and look forward to tomorrow. We can help and support our fellow patients. We can pursue our hopes and dreams. We can make a difference. Renal Support Network would like to thank everyone who has made this show possible. Kidney Talk's founding sponsor is Amgen. Generous support is provided by Roche Pharmaceuticals and Astellas. Friends of Kidney Talk are Abbott Laboratories, American Region, and Fresenius Medical Care North America. Thank you for helping us stream health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. Visit rsnhope.org for more information.